Welcome to this special edition of Wild Talk. This one's a little different. We've got Rod Giltaka on for the next hour. We're covering C21, what's going on with the amendments. We're talking about the court case and how the judge actually handled it, which is really interesting. Uh, a little bit on some upcoming topics of CCFR Radio on the air. And then, of course, uh, how we can support the CCFR and any other groups that are actually actively fighting the government on these orders and councils and these gun bans in C-21. Wild Talk is brought to you by Trapper Gourds and Wild TV Plus. Welcome to this episode of Wild Talk. Today we have brought back Rod Giltaka. I'm sure you guys know who I am. I'm Scott Sterling. I'm the guest host today. Rod, always a pleasure to have you on Wild Talk. Thanks for coming back and chatting with us today. Thanks for having me. So we've got some updates on some stuff here. An update on C21, an update on the lawsuit, and we're going to talk a little bit about what's coming up as far as information that's going to be uh, on CCFR radio, on the air, on Wild TV exclusively here in Canada, on different topics that our viewers here at Wild Talk should be watching on CCFR radio if they care any little tiny bit about what's going on with the property and with the guns and so forth in Canada here right now. So let's, uh, let's jump right into it, Rod. I mean, um, I've heard that we finally have a decision on the CCFR versus Canada court case. Yeah. I'm going to kind of let you take it from there and what's going on, what happened? Well, this, the, the decision isn't what we wanted. Um, Judge, uh, well, Justice Kane of the uh, Federal Court of Canada ruled against the CCFR and all the other applicants ruled against us and in favor of the government on every count. How many uh, how many others were involved, Rod, in the uh, in the lawsuit? I think there was five or six other parties, and uh, what happened was the uh, the court decided to lump us all into one uh, one case because um, some of the grounds upon which we were suing the government were similar, so they decided to hear the case all in one. Uh, we had, we went, I think we went to the court with six, six or seven different issues that we wanted a ruling on. And, but most of the other parties were one issue, which was the order in council from the May 2020 gun ban. Um, but the judge ruled against all of us on every count. And it was, it's, it's kind of a strange situation that's going on. So I, it, if I'm going to elaborate a little bit to kind of fill in mm. the blanks. Please so do. typically. Yeah, typically when you have a, a case like ours, which was a charter challenge as well, and we asked a lot of very fundamental questions, uh, property rights questions, self-defense questions, all kinds of things. The fight between licensed gun owners and the government is about what the government is able to do to its citizens legally. Apparently, Canadians don't have property rights. This seems to be the verdict from other historic cases on the subject. But what does this mean for people who don't own guns? It means that currently, the government can decide without any real justification that something you own should be illegal and will be confiscated. The way the law is today, this can apply to anything, your land, your bank account, your car, anything you legally own. And under any pretense, climate, emergency, pandemic, public safety, the economy, literally anything. We are in the midst of a historic gun ban. It equates to a massive confiscation of property from hundreds of thousands of people who legally acquired it. These RCMP vetted Canadians are licensed to own these firearms and are inherently responsible. The government hasn't felt an obligation to justify it other than with political sloganeering and highlighting the acts of criminals who are already banned from possessing firearms in the first place. Today, it's about legally purchased firearms, but tomorrow, it might be about something you own or a right you value. Typically, when you get a decision in a case like this, the decision is several hundred pages because the judge will have had to articulate all of the legal reasons, the, the, the legal standards that she was um, applying 
in her decision. And the decision was really scant. It was very short. And basically, I'm, and I'm paraphrasing, obviously, the decision was, well, here's what you guys said. Here's what the government said. I agree with the government. Next point. Here's what you said. Here's what the government said. I agree with the government. And so it that looks weird to us. And it's like, well, you you didn't want to elaborate on any of the law, really, to, to, to the degree that we're used to. And you just sided with the government on all counts, even when we have a multi-million dollar legal team that says, there's no way. Like the government did not have the administrative authority to do this OIC thing. And yet the right. judge is like, oh yeah, I agree with the government. So it's, it's weird. I'm not implying anything, uh, but we are appealing uh, to the uh, Federal Court of Appeal, uh, Judge Kane's mm -hmm. decision. Uh, we've registered for that appeal by the time anyone's watching this, that we will have already registered for that appeal. And we'll keep you updated in, uh, on as far as what the timeline looks like. But, uh, but it's a strange decision and um, it's not what we wanted, but we just, we're here to fight. So we're just gonna keep on fighting. Don't go away. We'll be right back with more from Rod Giltaka here on Wild Talk. Well, you, you didn't want to elaborate on any of the law really to, to, to the degree that we're used to. And you just sided with the government on all counts, even when we have a multi-million dollar legal team that says, there's no way. So instead of actually going through, and I just want to clarify this for our viewers, instead of going through each point that the judge ruled on, and it would typically be the pieces and the portions of that law or the particular sections of that law that pertain to their decision, they didn't even bother doing that. They just said, they said this, CCFR, government said this, CCFR said that, we agree with the government, next point. Like they didn't even bother um, expanding on what por like what portion of the law covers that decision. Is that, am I understanding that right? Not to the degree that we're used to in seeing decisions like this. So yeah, I don't, and I don't, you know, I don't want to speculate about the motivation there. Um, but it took, that decision took six and a half months, I think. And it was very short. And yeah, I don't know. I, like I say, I, I'm, I'm trying to stop myself, Scott, from speculating I know. about what's I going know, on there, but it's, yeah, it's like, hard. <laughs> I, I, yeah. Well, it is hard. Right. Um, I'm trying to exercise a little bit of discipline, but, but I think the most concerning takeaway for Canadians is the court has basically said, and this is the opinion of the court. And, and again, I'm paraphrasing is the government can reach into your life, grab whatever it wants from you, whether you you know, whether you uh, obtained it legally and used your after tax money and abided by the law, 100 doesn't matter what it is. Any, you do not have property rights literally at all in Canada. If the government has a justification in their own mind they, that they should take something from you, whether it's your car, your property, like your, you know, real estate or guns or whatever, it can just do it. I too am not going to speculate, but uh, it does seem rather suspect <laughs> that, yeah. uh, that the judge agreed with the government and essentially by this decision gave them the power to write an OIC and take whatever the heck they want from anybody whenever they want, whenever they see fit, right? I, it's Well, it's, it's a little bit... I don't know if concerning is is strong enough word, but it's almost terrifying that in in our system, the only the only hedge you have on a government that's malevolent that just decides, you know what, this is can this is politically convenient for us. This is might be a vote getter. We can stay in power another four years, win another election. We're just going to take this group of people and just grab whatever we want from them. The only recourse you have, other than an election, than a political solution, is to go to the courts. And the courts are supposed to be that other side of the scale, right? That balances it out. It's like, well, government, you can't just do whatever you want. We're the only group of people that have the power to say that you can't do that. Well, it seems like they're just rubber stamping everything. And, and I, I will add, and it's a little bit selfish on my part, that for me, this is what it seems like. It seems like whenever I'm looking at these decisions where the, where the, where the courts go against the government and say, well, that's unconstitutional or you know, that's not, you know, that's against the charter or whatever. It seems like they're defending criminals when that happens. Whenever a criminal seems to do something, it's like, oh, you can't, 
you know, you can't infringe on this guy's rights. You know, it's wrong because, hey, God forbid a, a good citizen get ensnared in the same thing. It's like, well, it seems like you're always going to bat for the criminals. And criminals seem to be able to afford to do these multi-million dollar constitutional challenges and win, which is very strange to me. But then here we're saying like, hey, we're licensed gun owners. We have firearms for hunting and sport shooting and inheritance and whatever, all the legitimate reasons we abide by the law. But it's like, nope, the, the harshest scrutiny goes against the good citizens and and we're protecting the interests of, of criminals. It's, and that's just the way it seems to me. But that's one of the things that makes me really frustrated about the whole thing. Don't go away. We'll be right back with more from Rod Giltaka here on Wild Talk. And criminals seem to be able to afford to do these multi-million dollar constitutional challenges and win, which is very strange to me. But then here we're saying like, hey, we're licensed gun owners. We have firearms for hunting and sport shooting and inheritance and whatever, all the legitimate reasons we abide by the law. But it's like, nope, the, the harshest scrutiny goes against the good citizens and, and we're protecting the interests of, of criminals. It's, and that's just the way it seems to me. But that's one of the things that makes me really frustrated about the whole thing. I mean, you got to kind of ask yourself, <laughs> he's obviously not, he's obviously not pandering to rural Canadians or Canadians who enjoy hunting, fishing, outdoors, outdoors men and women. He's not, not catering to those. He's catering to the major urban centers saying, oh, well, we're going to, we, we got these guns and you, you can't get them. And it's just mind boggling how the government has reached in to the private lives of Canadians with no recourse. There's, there's just, there, there, there's no, there's no way for us to come back at them other than this case. When you guys are in the, uh, you guys are in the court case, you guys, we lost now you're appealing it, but that's the only recourse that we have against the government. And I mean, you can't speculate what the outcome is going to be, but I'm sure you and myself and all our viewers have a pretty good idea what we think is going to happen with the appeal too. Well, I, I don't know. I think it's harder. The, the appeal courts are a tribunal, right? There's three judges. And if it can't be solved at the, at the, um, the court of appeal may say, well, Hey, we're not the proper um, jurisdiction for this to be held. And then it will go to the Supreme court of Canada, maybe, right. Mm -hmm. And then Supreme court of Canada can, reject any case that it really wants to, if they don't think it's important enough. But right. the, the whole idea is we're not going to stop. We're a, a, a fairly well supported organization and we have enough people behind us that we can keep going all the way to the Supreme court. If, uh, if that's what needs to happen. So anyway, it's, yeah, it's a little bit, a little bit terrifying that you have no rights at all to property in Canada, even, you know, just it's the whole thing is, is pretty bad, but it's not over yet. And we're not giving up anytime soon. No, and we appreciate you and the, the team at the CCFR and everyone who's involved in the fight against this. I mean, I can call it a boondoggle, I guess, or something else. There's so much different stuff going on in the in the background with uh, with against the government at this point. It's hard to keep it all uh, hard to keep it all straight. So, yeah. you know, here's a here's another question for you, Rod. So, is there any way for um, the parties that are involved in lawsuits, appeals, and so forth, to ensure, and I, and I believe this is the right term, nonpartisan judges that will look at this case effectively and, you know, from a fifty thousand foot view, instead of looking at it from one side or the other actually take everything into account. Is there any way to, to make sure that we're getting that kind of judge with this type of court case? Don't go away. We'll be right back with more from Rod Giltaka here on Wild Talk. Here's another question for you, Rod. So is there any way for... Um, the parties that are involved in lawsuits, appeals, and so forth, to ensure, and I, and I believe this is the right term, nonpartisan 
judges that will look at this case effectively and you know from a 50,000 foot view instead of looking at it from one side or the other actually take everything into account is there any way to to make sure that we're getting that kind of judge with this type of court case uh, no it's where it's judges are appointed and they're appointed mm -hmm. by government so if a government is really active and they're appointing a lot of judges they can appoint any judge they want any lawyer to become a judge so it's uh it's a bit of a crapshoot you can't mm -hmm. you can't select your judge the uh, the court itself does that um but all you can do is you can just set yourself up the best you possibly can for success like one of the good takeaways from from positive takeaways from this case is we didn't lose this case because we hired like a one man shop lawyer because he was cheap and you know we just wanted to have a case because we're fundraising off it or whatever we right right told our supporters gun owners that we were going to hire the best team not just an individual but a team that money could buy so that if we lost this that it wasn't because we didn't you know, um, uh, put the proper amount of resources behind it. So we had a multi-million right. dollar team. So we didn't lose this because we didn't send the right people, you know, out to bat. We lost it because there's there's a problem with Canadian law and with, I guess you could say, the elite class in Canada believing that you just don't have a right to to have anything. And so, well, I um, mean, it, that's even a, that's even a hard statement for you to make, Rod, because they didn't cite any laws in their decision. Is that, uh, that's correct, right? Well, she cited cases, but the, but they were, I believe case they law. were case. Yeah. They were cases that were, um, that were offered by either side, our side or the, the, uh, the, the attorney general of Canada side. Um, uh, but she didn't elaborate at the level as expected to say, well, here's why these cases are either applicable or they're inapplicable and you lose. Mm -hmm. It was just like, I agree with you and your case law, you know? And it's like, well, yeah. That's not how they're normally supposed to look. But anyway, as I said, <laughs> we're not done fighting. We're going to go all the way and we, we can and we will. So there'll be more to come on this on this topic. Perfect. All right. Well, that one's out of the way. Now for everybody's favorite topic, C21. <laughs> so, uh, Rod, you went out, uh, you said you went out to uh, to speak at Parliament. And this is a really interesting topic. So I'm literally going to just flip this over to you and I'll interject if I get any questions along the way. But this is really interesting what happened with your trip to Ottawa to testify at the Senate on Bill C-21. So what happened and go. All right. So um, I did go to Ottawa a couple of weeks ago and uh, to testify as an expert witness to the Senate committee. Um, uh, well, really against Bill C-21. And I went there specifically for one provision of Bill C-21, which is the handgun ban. And this right. is this is kind of an interesting topic, especially when you might have a lot of hunters or casual firearm owners. Right. Because there's a lot of gun owners in Canada, about two point three million. And not all of them are, you know, sports shooters that that run with handguns. Uh, there are about 650,000 people in Canada that are licensed to own handguns or restricted firearms, right? So those are handguns or, or AR-15s, let's say. Yeah. And about 450,000 people actually own handguns. And there's about 1.2 million handguns in Canada now. So anyway, the uh, Bill C-21, uh, as you know, the those amendments that that was that we're going to ban like all of the mauser action firearms like the the hunting rifles the uh the parker hail rifle don't go away we'll be right back with more from rod giltaka here on wild talk the uh bill c21 uh as you know the those amendments that that was that we're going to ban like all of the mauser action firearms like the the hunting rifles the uh the parker hail rifle what was it before rod it was uh they had the two amendments and those were tossed out but they had 90 some odd that were waiting in the wings to go through that was back yeah. a, a few months ago is that that's, that's what we're right talking? same same thing right okay so yeah so some of those were consequential others weren't some of them, some of those amendments had to do with ghost guns or whatever. I think we can all agree that we don't want criminals making their own guns, 
and that be not be right. not be a problem, <laughs> right? Because that is truly a problem for <laughs> for public safety. Yes. Um, so, Absolutely. Yeah. So some of those amendments um, were had passed. Some were, were were rejected, but the two big ones were G4 and G46, which was the um, which was the uh, the definition of assault style rifle, and for that to be retroactive. So any firearm that has a detachable magazine, whatever, like the Browning bar would have been prohib, all that stuff, if that had gone through. And of course that big list, which was the Ruger number one and the Mausers. That was and, like, what was it? 300 and some odd, 380 or 360 some odd pages long, if I recall. That's right, that's right. And, and all of them just would have been like flat out in legislation, prohib. And, and you're like, well, what? You know, like just bolt actions. So there's a bunch of stuff on there. Those were those were um, were withdrawn. But what's left in Bill C-21 is a is is a definition of assault style rifle going forward to all new models. And then um, you also have the handgun ban. And then you also have the government saying, well, and this in some ways could be a lot worse than those two amendments. At least with those two amendments, you knew what was going to be prohibited. But now the government has said, we're not going to ban all those guns in legislation like we like we were going to. We're going to reform a committee called the Canadian Firearms Advisory Committee, stack it with anti-gunners, because they've already said the kinds of groups that they want to have on there. Um, and those are victims groups and, you know, all, you know, public safety experts and anti-gun groups and whatever. And that committee will get together and write out all the existing firearms they think should be banned. And then the government has committed to ban those using, you guessed it, orders in council like they did on May 1st, uh, 2020. So now it's a group, a handpicked group of, of liberal anti-gun supporters and whoever else, I mean, whatever, I can't say that definitively, but their handpicked group to be on the committee, which will instruct the government to ban whatever guns they say should be banned. So it's, so the plus side, it's not in legislation. So that's good. Another government mm -hmm. can undo that with a stroke of a pen but it's by OIC, so that could happen at any moment. So when that committee starts getting together, they start writing their lists, those guns could be banned like, you know, two days later. So uh, it's still a big mess, but there's, there's a lot more to talk about Bill C-21 though. Don't go away, we'll be right back with more from Rod Giltaka here on Wild Talk. But what's left in Bill C-21 is a, is, is a definition of assault style rifle going forward to all new models. And then um, you also have the handgun ban. And then you also have the government saying, well, and this in some ways could be a lot worse than those two amendments. At least with those two amendments, you knew what was going to be prohibited. But now the government has said, we're not going to ban all those guns in legislation like, we're, like we were going to. We're going to reform a committee called the Canadian Firearms Advisory Committee, stack it with anti-gunners, because they've already said the kinds of groups that they want to have on there. Um, and those are victims groups and, you know, all, you know, public safety experts and anti-gun groups and whatever. And that committee will get together and write out all the existing firearms they think should be banned. Is there any way to make sure that us as legal gun owners actually have a voice on this hand-picked little group that are going to go through and ban a whole bunch more guns because they don't like how they look. Is there any way for, to, for us to get representation on that? Or are they just going to do what they typically do and keep the stakeholders out that are going against what they're trying to do just to push things through like they have like, for years and years and years and years and years? So there's, we have, no one has any control over how that committee is made up other than the Liberal Party of Canada. So, um, and that's because they're in government. So they can strike any committee they want. They can pick anyone they want. Um, I would think that they're gonna put a few people in there. The last um, uh, firearms advisory uh, committee had uh, Link, Linda Keiko, who was an Olympic pistol shooter. They had a few people like that, but th those were the people that were representing, you know, firearm owners. They weren't actual right. firearm groups like the CCFR where we have that expertise and we know these things. They, we weren't on those committees. So um, we'll have to see. They may want it to look fair. Um, 
But the devil's in the details when it comes to those committees. And I'll, let me just give you one example is mm. the government can put whatever requirements they want um, on membership of that committee. So they could say, Rod, you, yeah, you're going to, you know, you, you guys are Canada's gun lobby. Sure. You should be on there because you're representing the interests of uh, at least a hundred thousand licensed gun owners across the country. Uh, fine. Right. You're on the committee, but they can say, well, here's your agreement. Uh, here's a non-disclosure. You can't talk about what the conversations were or how you arrived at any decisions as a, as a committee, uh, but you're on it. And it's like, well, if, if I'm on this committee and it's coming out with all these ban lists and I'm the only guy that voted against it, I should be able to tell people, you know, like, you know, the, the, the majority of the people are voting or who's voting for what or whatever, but they can put any of these constraints on, which will still get the result at the end of the day that they want. So it shouldn't be up to some committee whether guns are banned or not. Again, this is private property that people have purchased. So I think what I'm trying to say, Scott, is the ramifications, like the effect of what they're doing should, should dictate what that process should look like. It shouldn't be just some committee of handpicked people deciding that the government should use force to grab property out of people's homes. You know, that's too big of a deal. It's like, we should have a set of laws and we all abide by them and that's the end of it. And they should be reasonable and they should be reasonable to the point where people will comply with them. Because when licensed gun owners start acting, when they, when you have non-compliance, that's bad for everybody. Laws have to be reasonable. So anyway, this committee could turn out to be a real mess. Well, it wouldn't surprise me in the least. <laughs> so what, um, tell me a little more about what happened when you sat in front of the Senate and testified in front of the Senate, Rod. How was, you know, how was what you said received? Um, did they stop you from talking? Did they cut you? Like, what happened? I, I haven't actually watched uh, watched the video of it yet. So, well, for anyone that saw my appearance to the uh, House Committee for Bill C twenty one, saw what an absolute flaming train wreck it was. Right, because the people that are questioning you are actual politicians. So they're there to, you know, when it came to me, there was this a big character assassination effort and running over me and doing all these things to try to discredit gun owners uh, through me, obviously. But when you get to the Senate, senators are appointed and they're appointed for life. So they're not, it's not as partisan a place. And I'll tell you, I went there and I was prepared to deal with people like I would have dealt with them in the House Committee, right? I was prepared for that right. kind of thing. Uh, but it was actually quite polite. And it was quite insightful. And one of the things that we did on behalf of the CCFR, and this is really interesting, is I created an 18 minute video because you only get five minutes as an opening statement and you can only answer right. questions that are asked of you after. The format is kind of, kind of lame in my opinion. So I created this video and it was very nice. You can go to the CCFR's YouTube channel and you can see it. it's called uh, Bill C-21 for Senators. And I sent that to all the senators in the Senate as well as asked our supporters to send that video as well as individuals saying, watch this video. This is our position on the handgun ban. And you know what? Everybody on that committee watched it. So they ended up with 18 minutes to understand our position on all these things before I even got there. So they get a, kind of an overview and now we get to reinforce it. So my opening statement, I talked about handgun ownership and why it was so important. And this is what I want to share with, with your viewers on this, mm -hmm. on your, your your show, which is not everybody understands why people own handguns and they un don't understand the impact to a ban. And it's really important that they do. So as I mentioned, 450,000 people own handgun. There's a $2 billion industry around sports shooting in Canada at, per year. Okay. And there are 1400 shooting clubs across the country who rely, I wouldn't say exclusively, but very close, if not completely exclusively on handgun owners to stay alive because if you own a handgun or an AR-15 or other restricted firearm, you have to be a member of a shooting club and that's the only place you can shoot it. So shooting clubs rely on, on handgun owners. Well, there's 1400. If you ban handguns and over time, all of us die off and those handguns are gone. These are people that aren't patronizing clubs anymore. You'll end up losing at least half, probably 700 clubs across the country that Canadians have paid billions of dollars to acquire real estate, develop it and maintain it over generations. So I, you know, whether or not you own a handgun, handgun owners existing is very important to you and your club and your community, yeah. because that's probably the biggest piece that keep it all going. So 
I wanted the senators to understand that. You ban handguns, this is what you're doing. You're extinguishing an entire culture that has existed for generations. And you're going you're gonna to have to tolerate the generational anger that comes along with that by attacking these people who are by, they're, they're licensed gun owners that get a criminal background check every single day. You are 100% attacking the wrong people if you're trying to stop firearm related violence. So it was really important for them to understand the, the, the consequences of all that. And I think that message got through really quite clearly between the video and my appearance there. Don't go away. We'll be right back with more from Rod Giltaka here on Wild Talk. They're licensed gun owners that get a criminal background check every single day. You are 100% attacking the wrong people if you're trying to stop firearm related violence. So it was really important for them to understand the, the, the consequences of all that. And I think that message got through really quite clearly between the video and my appearance there. What's next with C21? What, what's coming up? What are, we, what are we dealing with here? Well, um, let me just add this. Uh, is while we were in Ottawa, I did, uh, Tracy Wilson and I did a, uh, a press conference in, well, the, the new press room, I think it's in center block, it's underground, but it's between center block and West block. But, uh, okay. but we did a press conference. And again, um, in the, in the latest episode of, uh, CCFR radio on the air, you'll see a, some B roll of it. You see what that looks like, but you can always go to the YouTube channel, CCFR YouTube channel and check out the whole press conference, or it's actually on the okay. CPAC website as well. Um, but it's really important to go there and and do these press conferences and let people know what's going on. Um, so that actually turned out very well. But what's next for C21 is, as we've been talking about, it's it's in the Senate process. Um, it'll be it will pass because the liberals have the votes in the Senate as well. And the, the uh, C21 <laughs> should become law. C21 should become law somewhere between um, the end of December towards the end of December, or if it doesn't make it, it'll be in February sometime. Well, just keep fighting the good fight, Rod, with uh, with the team and, you know, our viewers. Make sure you're supporting, you know, not not just the CCFR, but the other groups that are lobbying, that are, that are fighting for our rights as sportsmen and women, and also as Canadian property owners. Um, it's, it's crazy. Uh, Rod, what's the best website for folks to go to to get some more information on the CCFR and keep up to speed on C21 and everything that the CCFR is doing to fight this mess that the government keeps trying to throw at us. Well, if you're interested in uh, what the CCFR is doing, you go to ccfr.ca or firearmrights.ca. You can get there either way. And what mm -hmm. I would stress to people is, is if you're going to support an organization, make sure they're earning your support, right? It's very easy to say, oh, we have an organization now and you know you should be very supporting us because you're a gun owner. It's like, well, we wanna earn that support. So if you go there to ccfr.ca, you'll see up at the top, it says, why join? And if you click that button, you'll find a running list of everything that we do. It's not just, oh, we, we're out there working every day. It's like, no, here's exactly what we're doing with support. They can scroll all the way down and see the latest stuff. It goes from the early days all the way down to what we just what we've just done. So make sure you check that out and, and see if the CCFR is a good um, a good fit for you as a gun owner. Perfect. So CCFR.ca or firearmrights.ca. Guys, educate yourselves, get the information, support broad, support the CCFR, support these groups that are working hard every single day to protect our way of life and our lifestyle. Um, and maybe, you know what, and this is something too, Rod, folks might not, might not know, but we have, uh, you have a television show on Wild TV exclusively here in Canada called CCFR Radio on the air. And you've got some really interesting topics coming up in the next couple of episodes. So why don't we finish off this chat with uh, what's coming up on CCFR Radio on the air, and then uh, we'll take her from there. Well, as you know, CCFR Radio on the Air is, uh, is seen exclusively on Wild TV. So I, I have to tell you, I really appreciate the support. Um, but it is a, uh, you know, it's a, it's a, it's, it's sort of a firearm news show. Whoever thought that that would even be possible that there would be so much going on to get a, have an actual show about it. 
Uh, but it is, yeah. and we have a lot of fun and watch, you know, see some crazy clips. Um, it might be a little angering when you see the the political underbelly of what the government does to gun owners. But anyway, we uh, we try to make it as fun as possible. Uh, right. But there's a, a couple of interesting stories coming up. One is the um, an ATIP, which is an access to information uh, document surfaced. I think it was uh, originally um, released by the gun, gunblog.ca. And in that ATIP, uh, it turns out that the liberal government had the buyback and the confiscation um, thing for the uh, for the assault style weapons ban of, of May 1st, 2020, they'd been sitting on it yeah. for somewhere around a year. And they had a presentation what? a year previous that said their own, yeah, their own government said that this thing was gonna cost somewhere around $1.8 billion to do. Well, it was su such a public safety priority that they did absolutely nothing. They sat on this whole thing and waited until something bad happened, which was the Nova Scotia shooting. And then they rolled it out, right? Because resistance to it would be low. And yep. when they rolled it out, Bill Blair was, uh, was there. And he said, and you, you're probably gonna see a clip in a second, that, um, that this buyback of this magnitude, he says, so that you're believing that they're overestimating it, would cost somewhere mm -hmm. around 350 to $400 million. Basically one fifth or one tenth of what it would really cost based on their estimates. How much will it cost you to buy back these semi-automatic rifles? As I said, there's about, there's about 2,500 of these that no, known in private hands in Canada. Um, we've, we've done some research. Uh, I think they, you mean 250,000, right? 200, excuse yeah. me, 250,000, I apologize. And, and of, of those guns, you know, they, they range in price, some of them as low as $300, some of them up to several thousands. But on average, it's about $1,500 per weapon. And, and so that, a buyback of, of that magnitude would be somewhere in the neighborhood of $350 million or to, to $400 million. As well, there's some costs associated. You know, if, if you buy one of these guns currently from a licensed retailer, it's often delivered either by FedEx or Canada Post. And, and so we are looking at safe ways in which those weapons can be collected in a very cost efficient way and also to make sure that law enforcement has the resources they need to oversee that collection so that it can be done safely. This is so distressing because, you know, they were so convinced that public safety was at risk. They didn't do anything until somebody got hurt. They wanted to wait. And then yeah. they flat out lie to Canadians, telling them that it costs like a fifth or a tenth of what they think it would cost. And I mean, we know what that, we know how they do their accounting. The long gun registry was supposed to cost $2 million, but it cost $2 billion. It was a thousand percent over. Don't go away. We'll be right back with more from Rod Giltaka here on Wild Talk. This is so distressing because, you know, they were so convinced that public safety was at risk. They didn't do anything until somebody got hurt. They wanted to wait. And then yeah. they flat out lie to Canadians, telling them that it costs like a fifth or a tenth of what they think it would cost. And I mean, we know what that, we know how they do their accounting. The long gun registry was supposed to cost $2 million, but it cost $2 billion. It was a thousand percent yeah, but, over. You know, but... Budgets balance themselves though, right, Rod? Well, this is the thing. So even worse under, under the liberal, Trudeau liberals, right? So anyway, the, when, when, when politicians lie that, that overtly and they don't care, it's very corrosive, right, to, to the Canada that we all grew up in. So anyway, that, that story is, is one of the ones we're talking about. Um, and then we had another one. <laughs> uh, and basically there was a journalist from Montreal uh, that um, writes for La Presse which is a publication uh, in Quebec. And this guy, what he decided to do, and this was a, um, I guess it's an effort to expose how licensed gun owners are criminals and how we conduct ourselves, oh, that he, really? he went and he went on a Facebook group and illegally bought a, an SKS and then took the magazine, a, uh, a removable magazine from the SKS, popped the rivet out and fired it. And so committed, documented, committed multiple federal firearm offenses, serious offenses that require jail time. Mm -hmm. One of those offenses has a, uh, a mandatory minimum, by the way, and wrote a story in the press about it and said that the Montreal Police Service gave him permission to do this. And so this, <laughs> this story is wild on so many levels because the police can't what? give you permission to break the no. law. They don't have that authority, <laughs> number one. 
Number two, if they if they were coerced him to break the law, like that's some kind of collusion going on. Number three, the anti-gunners loved it. They thought this was the greatest thing ever. They're tweeting all about it. Like, oh, look at this exposed. It's like, well, yeah, we know that you can you can buy illegal guns. Like everybody knows that. You don't have to do it to prove that it can be done. And by yeah. the way, you you can't break the law. You know, like <laughs> Anyway, it was it was quite a story and it was quite wrong on a lot of levels. But uh, we, we cover that uh, quite extensively in the next episode of CCFR Radio on the Air. Awesome. Well, Rod, as always, man, it's a pleasure to have you on. Thank you so much for taking the time to enlighten our viewers on all the stuff that's going on, everything that the CCFR and, and you and your teams there are working on and fighting the good fight. And we all thank you very, very much for that. As far as CCFR radio on the air, make sure you check your local listings. It'll be in your electronic program guide, or you can catch the latest episode just a couple of days after its first airing on Wild TV Plus. So that's wildtvplus.ca for the web, or you can download the app on your Samsung TV, Android TV, uh, mobiles, uh, Android, iOS, all the different mobile devices, uh, Roku's, et cetera, et cetera. So, you don't ever have to miss a uh, an episode of Wild Talk or CCFR Radio on the air. Um, Rod, I know from past episodes, you and I have you know urged our viewers here to write their MPs, to call their MPs, to you know keep the pressure on. Is that still something that's going to keep working here, or should they be shifting their their focus to some other group or some other thing? Um, to put pressure on the government so this, you know, eventually goes away or at least we get a fair shake? Well, the only the only solution that we have is we're, we're fighting the government in court, and that's going to take another year probably um, to get some kind of ruling on the appeal. But the most important thing is a political solution. So if you do nothing else, make sure that if there's an election called that you go and you vote and you reject the bloc, the NDP, and the liberals. That's the only way really to get all of your guns back and, and, and ensure that you're not going to be attacked again and not only go to vote, like do not miss that opportunity. I think people get lazy when it's voting time because everybody's working and they're tired, but you, you have to take the time to do it. And you have to take your neighbors and your family members, everybody you can, even if you're in a conservative stronghold riding, it still doesn't matter. We want a very clear mandate for the conservatives to, to, to treat us like we're, you know, like we deserve to be treated. So take everybody, even if you drive people to the polls yourself and take them home and feed them hot chocolate or whatever on the way, you got to make sure that you do not miss that opportunity to vote, to vote because that is the political solution that will solve all of this. That's how our system works in Canada. Well, it's, uh, it's really our only, our only voice where we can, you know, besides sending letters and barking and screaming and yelling, that's the only way that we can make what's happening here disappear. So it's our voice, but it's only a voice if you decide to actually use it. So make sure you guys vote in the next election. Make sure you vote properly. I'm not going to tell you how to do it, but Rod has laid it out very clearly which groups are siding with the current government for the gun bans and which group is not. So. I'm sure it's not that hard to make a decision. But anyways, yeah. um, Scott Sterling signing off on this episode of Wild Talk. Rod, again, thank you so much, man, for joining us. We'll love to have you back on again. And again, our viewers, make sure that you guys check out CCFR Radio on the air and take the time to educate yourself on what the CCFR has been doing to fight the gun bans and the unconstitutionality of the orders in council for taking your property and that's ccfr.ca and firearmrights.ca. Wild Talk is brought to you by Trapper Gourds and Wild TV Plus.